Hi, I'm Charlotte and this is Time Mama Tries to Read for the last time in 2019. Um, I'm excited. I am done with 2019. I don't know about you guys and how your year went, but um, I don't know. It just doesn't stand up there with my my best years. I think there were some good things and I knew you meant to count your blessings and I really, really, really do. But I just had a lot of illness, so um, reading-wise, certainly channel-wise, this was not my finest moment. Um, I just, you know, I've only been filming once a month, and I've been, my, my total of books, which I'm not going to tell you now, because that's going in my stats video, but my total wasn't anywhere near what I wanted. And I know that that doesn't, you know, that's not the be-all and end-all, but... You know, I genuinely feel mentally happier when I'm reading and I've had so many points where I've just been desperate to sit and just get into another world or just to educate myself. And so I thought I saw a really big spider, but it, <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, yeah. And, you know, just the shed, like the shed is so nice, but I've just I've hardly been in here. Um, and, you know, I'm in here now in my finest clothes <laughs> because you know, I've been playing with Idris and we've been sorting out all his Christmas toys, of which there are a bajillion. Um, very wisely, we bought a lot of games for him this year, partly because I wanted to try and limit the plastic that he was having. He was already having lots of plastic toys. So I thought if I get him um, board games, you know, you've gotten either their cardboard or their wood or whatever. And he has loved it. But the downside of my genius plan is that he has to have someone to play with. And I know that sounds really mean, but um, like his plastic toys, like his his um, dinosaurs and he's got this Hot Wheels thing, he can play with that by himself, but he can't he can't play Snakes and Ladders by himself. Although he, although he has actually done that and played two parts, which is just so sad. So yeah, I've been doing that all morning and I've been arranging, really sadly, I've been arranging his Lego into tiny little boxes into the into the sets because I just I just can't deal with it all being mixed up oh there's a little I've got to film outside the window because there's the most gorgeous little blue tit out there right now just looking in at me um I decided to put the peanut feeder for the squirrels right outside my window but they drain it in fact they've actually they've obviously thought I can't I can't be bothered to just like take a peanut at a time so they've chewed a giant hole in which I didn't notice until I poured the peanuts in the other day their little allotted peanut um what's the word I'm looking for not portion ration they have a ration and the peanuts just spilled out all over the floor outside my shed so so it's freezing in here it smells bad well not bad but it doesn't smell great all of the books I've got in here which aren't that many are starting to curl look at the Christmas lights like uh, there some of them have come back on but look a lot of them come on are just very sad because it's damp so anyway 2019 i am i am done with you and 2020 i don't know how it can be different but we'll, we will try so yeah let's get on to december wrap up so this book i started in november i briefly vlogged about it if women rose rooted the journey to authenticity and belonging by sharon blackie and i really found this such a, a thought-provoking book it's one of those books that whilst there were flaws in it that just you know I, I I felt I had to mention I think I mentioned a couple of them in my vlog the over just the amount of discussion that even the flaws creates made it well a four slightly over four star read for me whereas some of it like dips down to three if that makes any sense but then the discussion it provokes puts, puts it back up there and some of the bits um where she talks about mental health because she's talking about women she's talking about history of the British landscape which in, in particular which is quite interesting because you get a lot of um, books that are spiritual that, that rely on other cultures um, you know it's cultural appropriation basically to explain uh, you know how you might be able to embrace like a Native American tradition to do this or you know and, and they or you know even like yoga you know using yoga to heal not really fully understanding all the religious aspects of yoga so all of that and she says you know this is this is rooted in British landscape British myth 
and in that way it's it's ours it's truly ours and we can kind of use it legitimately she doesn't really go along the cultural appropriation angle as much as i thought she could have and it worried me in places that there was a sense sense of nationalism and essentialism in, in what she was saying because she was talking about things like um uh, you know, you can't really connect to a landscape unless it's your own. It's a very dangerous thing to start talking like that. It, I, I could, it, she softens it later and says that you can adopt that landscape, but ultimately she's got this hard line of it is what it is. And as, as an English person living in Wales, I just totally, my own personal experience disagrees with that. I feel 100% located in the Welsh landscape. I feel as, as Welsh as I'm allowed to feel and, and want to feel more, you know, and there's nothing about my, you know, I was in England till I was four and my parents are very English. So yeah, I didn't agree with that. But that's an example of how it provokes. Why you should read it is, um, it's just really interesting, the myths that she talks about, including one from my home village, um, which I lived in Llanaysant, but the village she's talking about is Motherby, which is more or less the same thing. The Lady of the Lake, um, myth which I love and I've you know it's part of of who I am so that was lovely but why you should read it as well is I feel like it was a really interesting alternative to journeying through life and how to sort of mentally get through it because she doesn't provide any quick fixes and British myths actually aren't really very easily decipherable there she says you know they're not like Greek myths where there's there's necessarily a clear answer as to where you should get moral guidance they're really confusing and I I like them for that. And when she goes into talking about time spent underground and the myths from the underground and caves and bogs, I just found it really comforting to, to relate to my own life and the idea that it's okay for me to be having a bad time and that's just part of the journey. And she relates it to bit, bits in her life too, which... Um, you know, another criticism is that she's lived quite a privileged life to be able to do half the things she's done. And she's also quite negative towards the city, which, again, is something I'm a bit, you know, I'm not a massive fan of that attitude. But on the whole, she's just made me want to get out into nature. She's made me want to go and visit historical sites. You know, we went to see King Arthur Stone the other day, and that was really beautiful. And, you know, I want to go and see Cairns. I want to go into the woods when I'm in the woods. I'm looking for wells. We've gone down to the well near to us and we've left um, some offerings and it just felt really you know every atheist is looking for some spirituality <laughs> and that is um, they get it from somewhere you know even if it's like art or whatever and I've definitely found some spirituality in this so I really think it's a readable book that you get a lot out of okay Christmas. So I read The Santa Claus Murder by Mavis Doriel Hey, I read this with Kate Howe. Um, I haven't actually got back to you, Kate. Um, I don't know if you finished it yet, so um, skip this. I'm not going to give any spoilers anyway, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I think this was the toughest read for me over Christmas because I had so many broken up bits with it, with all of the Christmas planning, that I don't feel like it got my full attention. In fact, there was a good week where I didn't touch it. And it's the sort of book that really needed a lazy afternoon, maybe two, and then just to read it all in one go. So otherwise, I, I'm definitely liking the British Library series. And as far as mysteries go, I'm definitely a Christmas mystery person. Then I read A Winter Book by um, Tove Janssen. I misspelt Janssen on my Instagram stories the other day and it really upset me. I spelt it with a Y. <laughs> so if any of you spotted that, I'm really sorry. It was just, you know, one of those little slip ups. But um, this is one of the ones I was going to read and then I thought, well, I'm never gonna have any time to read this. You know, let's just write it off. Then I read it in literally a few days. It was so easy to read. It's got loads of, of um, photographs in here of her family and her family's monkey and I was expecting it to be quite uplifting I don't know I read all the Moomin stories when I was little um if you don't know Tove Janssen wrote this amazing set of children's stories about um the Moomins which are these sort of big nosed white creatures um firmly set in um, Finland I'm guessing she's from Finland isn't she I want to say she, yes Finnish Whew. I was going to make a big geographical cock up then. <laughs> um, so yeah, loved all the Moomin stories when I was little, didn't see any darkness in them at all. Presumably if I read them back, 
there's going to be a lot of darkness. The first half of the book, um, these are all gathered posthumously. So they're not things that she necessarily put together in a, in this book. Um, the first half are like quite rooted autobiographical stories from her childhood. And there are, oh, there are some themes going on with those. But they really, I really stumbled with them because I wasn't expecting them to be like that. Second half then are more stories from her adulthood. There's an amazing short story in here about her and a squirrel and about the creativity of a writer and writer's block and being a loner and not wanting anyone to come near you. There's a great scene where she's on her island. She was famous for living on an island over the summer months and she sees some people in a boat coming towards her island and she just can't believe it. So she just scrambles around the house thinking, what do I do? What do I do? You know, she's on a, literally on a tiny little rock of an island. There's nothing she can do to get away. So she, in the end, she just decides to just leg it and she legs it to the other side of the island and like lowers herself down so she's like on the shoreline hiding and then she's like well they're going to get to the house and they're going to see that I'm not there and they're going to come looking for me and find me hiding behind this like edge of the uh, you know this rock <laughs> so she sort of crawls back it's just amazing it's exactly the sort of thing I would have done in that situation I loved it so there was lightness there was humor but it was also quite dark um, and then uh, I yesterday I very um, briefly sort of decided to pick this up, England Poems from a School, edited by Kate Clanchy. I bought this last summer um, and I sort of read a couple of the poems but I hadn't gone cover to cover. It is, it's just incredible. Um, I had tears in my eyes through most of it. The introduction is amazing. Kate Clanchy's style of her introduction and her little potted biographies of the students, because this is a collection of, of poems by... Um, students in an English comprehensive um, which is 80% made up of ethnic minorities and 20% white British so there's a real mix of cultures in there her introduction and her potty biographies are amazing but I really enjoyed that aspect of it it gave such a character sense of character to it and actually a lot of humor because once you get into the poems there's a lot going on a lot of the children writing are coming from refugee families and their experience of homesickness and of continuing emotional turmoil from the situations they're in is just out of this world. I feel like everybody who goes on about how immigrants just come to this country to, um, you know, try and steal our jobs and they just want to be on the dock. Anybody who thinks that should read this book and see the trauma that these children are facing every single day from leaving their homelands. And then maybe try and imagine how you'd feel if you had to leave the landscape not just your family, friends and all that, because they mention that, but the thing that really seems to chime through all of the poems is this loss of landscape, this loss of the smells, of the sights, of the sounds. So many of the children are coming from rural backgrounds and then they're exchanging that for this horrible grey reality of British weather and British estates and it's just, it's heartbreaking. There is hope in there though and the poems are just beautifully written. So yeah, 100% recommend this. A really emotional sort of end to my reading year. But then I thought I would try and finish off one of the books that I was halfway through. So I have got, there's quite a lot of um, notes in this one. So I've got, oh maybe, a bit more. no I've got just over a third to read. This is Daily Rituals, Women at Work by Mason Curry. So this is, I'm going to have to take some tea because it's absolutely freezing in here. I should have kept the fan on. Oh. Even my tea, which was scorching a minute ago, has now gone lukewarm. Um, yeah, this is Daily Rituals. This is um, little, again, little potted histories of writers. Um, you've got Susan Sontag, you've got Kate Chopin, Barbara Hepworth. Oh, it's not just writers, sorry. It's, it's artists and creators. So you've got sculptors, dancers, um, painters, choreographers, um, writers. It's amazing. I, I, I'd stopped... I don't know why. I think I stopped to do maybe a buddy read. Picking this back up again, I'm just amazed at how how inspiring it is. It's just making me want to write. It's making me want to reclaim the shed and actually do something with it. It's making me feel massively guilty for not carving time. It's making me realise I don't really need to feel massively guilty because actually some of these writers really couldn't carve the time either. Um, so many interesting things when you put women in the spotlight because they've got so many more domestic duties than the men the male writers and artists that I was reading about in his previous work and as I'm talking I've realized I forgot to bring Thorny Hold in so I'm gonna to have to include that in another wrap, wrap up I read um 
I read Thorny Hold as a buddy read in the last month. I can't believe I've left it in the house. Okay, so we'll have to carry a little bit of 2019 into 2020. But anyway, this is really good. So I'm going to try and finish it today. It's not going to be massively likely. I'm not planning on wild late nights, so I don't know. But I didn't want to leave too much from 2019 into the next year. I do feel that it's a very symbolic change and yeah. So that's it really. Um, I'm going to film tomorrow, hopefully, my books of the year, which I'm very excited to film and I've made the list. It's all set in stone. Um, and then I'll also probably film a stats video separately where we'll, we'll crunch some numbers. And then it's January. And yeah, I've got no specific plans, but I'd love to know what yours are. I'd love to know what your reading year was like and whether Christmas got in the way or whether you've read any of those books um, that I've mentioned today as well. So any chit chat, more than welcome. And yeah, I guess that's it from me signing out from 2019. See you next year.